be the moderator in this wonderful uh, meeting. Uh, I don't know, can Arabic or Anglese? Uh, he, he tells, telling me to, sp to, to speak in Arabic, uh, as I wish. All right, the majority is in Kalim Arabic or Anglese. In any case, all I said in English is that I'm privileged to be the moderator in this session. وأني سأدير الحوار وفق القواعد التي اخترنا بضرورة الالتزام بها حفاظا على الوقت وتعظيما للفائدة واستفادة من خبرة الأمم المتحدة ومنظمتها في ضبط إيقاع الاجتماعات والاستفادة القصوى منه في هذا الجزء من البرنامج متحدثون ثلاث ومعلقون ومناقشون خمسة المتحدثون هم بحسب ترتيب الأسماء كما وردت في القائمة المسيو جينارو أرجادا وهو عضو الحزب المسيحي الديمقراطي في شيلي وهو الرئيس أو السكرتير أو الأمين العام التنفيذي لحملة نو كامبين والتي أدت إلى هزيمة بينوشي في استفتاء أو اقتراع عام 1988 ثم معنا أيضا مسيو سيزار نافا من المكسيك وهو عضو في مجلس النواب من سنة 2000 إلى 2003 و2009 إلى 2012 وهو عضو في لجنة الدفاع القومي في مجلس النواب وهو رئيس البان مكسيكو بوليتيكال بارتي أو حزب السياسي المسمى بان مكسيكو والمتحدث الثالث هو الأستاذ أمين الرئيس وهو رائد وقائد في حركة المحمدية في إندونيسيا وهو الرئيس السابق لمجلس البرلمان في إندونيسيا ثم بعد ذلك أنا مدريتور وهناك معقبون خمسة الأستاذ مازن الساكت وهو وزير شؤون التنمية السياسية في دولة الأردن الشقيقة ثم الأستاذ نجيب سويرس وهو مؤسس حزب المصريون الأحرار أنا لا أرى الأستاذ نجيب أين أين الأستاذ نجيب موجود وهو صديق عزيز وأيضا الأستاذ غازي جيرياري وهو المتحدث الرسمي للجنة العليا للإصلاح السياسي في تونس ومعنا أيضا الأستاذ أيمن الصياد رئيس تحرير لجريدة وجهات نظر المصري والأستاذ أحمد زهران وهو خبير في شؤون البيئة من مصر فنبدأ بالمتحدث الأول وهو الأستاذ جينارو أرياجادا فليتفضل والمدة المخصصة لكل متحدث وعذروني أنا كنت متحدثا وأعرف القيد الشديد للوقت الشديد فالمدة المحددة عشر دقائق وإذا قلت قليلا يكون أفضل أفضل بس للنظام إنما نحن مشوقون للاستلام تفضل مشكورا لو سمحت Well let me say that ten minutes is not too much but I will try it to do my best. I will reduce my presentation to, to three main points. The first one is what I will call the, the, stale, the stalemate or the catastrophic equilibrium because uh, that is the beginning of any transition to democracy that I have seen. Uh, there is a moment in which you have in a society, in the political area, in the social world, a kind of a stalemate in which the dictatorship 
is enough powerful to remain in power, but at the same time, it is unable to destroy the opposition. And if you look this from the other point of view, the opposition is enough powerful to remain as a main political activist, having control of the union, of the student, but at the same time, don't have enough power to destroy the old order. This is what I have seen in any transition to democracy. And then you have this kind of a catastrophic equilibrium in which these two forces cannot have an outcome and the country began to be destroyed. I will say that this point lead me to what I will say is the, the golden rule of a transition to democracy is that a transition to democracy is, is a joint venture between the people that really, that truly believe in democracy and some other actors in the society that have some distrust or even feel fear about democracy. A transition of democracy to democracy is not is not some, something that you, the democratic forces, can build but yourself. It's of course your effort, but at the same time, it is necessary to achieve some agreement with forces that even distru distrust democracy. And because that, I will go to the second and to the third point. The second point is that we need to create some common ground. And the third point is that we need to create a broad coalition for democracy. What I will call common ground are some agreements that you, the forces that support democracy, achieve with some actors, political actors, social actors, institutional actors, that in a way look democracy uh, with not very good eyes. Perhaps I could be a little bit unpolite on this, but I will make reference because the limit of time to only three of these actors. One actor is the army. By definition, the military culture, even in the most advanced society, is authoritarian. That is the way in which they are educated. But looking to different transitions in different parts of the world, let me say I have worked with, with very different countries on this, for me, it's so clear that if you have clear principles and at the same time a lot of prudence, you can achieve a collaboration with the army. That is what I have seen in Chile, in Brazil, in different places. And let me say, of course, in the, in the, in the, in the European countries. And only two points on this, how to build this. I will say that you have two main issues. One is the code of military professionalism. Because in a democracy, the military must obey some principles. One is that they are professional. Second, that they must be submitted to the legitimate civilian power and serve that they must remain out of party politics. But at the same time, in a democracy, the civilian must obey also some principles. And those principles are that they have to respect the military career, that the military must not be subject of political manipulation, not their military academy, and if they are professional, they deserve a respect about their salary, about the, the means that make possible 
his profession. This is a, let me say, is an interchange in which you have some things that sometimes the military don't like, but something that the military claim and you have to respect. Second, I will say that you need to create also some common ground with the business community. Like the army, the concern of the, of the business community is not democracy, it's business. And because that, sometimes the business community uh, have some distance about, or a lot of distance, about this transition to democracy. And the person that are in charge of this must create some common ground with the business community that may possible a collaboration with the transition to democracy. And if I look again, a lot of transition all over the world, I will say that there is a lot of examples of a good relationship and the new principle between the forces of democracy and the business community. The business community won clear rules of the game and at the same time they want not to be prosecuted. A first, a first, not be prosecuted in individual terms, in, in, as a collective actor. Let me say, it's different to prosecute crime because a crime is always an offense made by an individual. It's different when you make this accusation to a whole part of the society. And I will make only a final issue on this. Of course, a democracy uh, must deal with past abuses on human rights. That is something that you cannot avoid. But again, if you have principles and you have prudence, it is possible to make a good agreement to make possible the prosecution of past abuses of, human, of crimes committed uh, uh, against uh, uh, humanity, against the person. Only a brief comment about Chile. We, we, have an, uh, uh, we accept that the commander-in-chief of the army, Pinochet, remained in power for eight years. We never accused the army as a whole, but we always prosecute those individuals in the army, generals, colonels, that commit crimes. And at the end of 10 years, all the generals that were part of the political police of the army were in prison. That means that you can create something in which you have to be prudent, not to accuse the whole army, not to prosecute the whole institution, but to, to prosecute a, a, a specific person. And I will finish immediately with something that I, I was saying that because it's a stalemate, it is necessary to create a common ground, even, and of course, with forces that sometimes distrust democracy, the army, the business community, and sometimes the international community, the former forces that support the, the former regime, is, is, is something difficult, but it's possible. But at the same time, it is necessary to create, I will say, a broad coalition for democracy. I have an experience in different countries, but I will say, as uh, the, for our former president, Michel Bachelet, said this morning, the main instrument to a successful transition to democracy is unity. If you don't have unity, the situation will be more difficult. It is necessary to have a unified coalition to support democracy. This is the name of the game, the principal name of the game, unity. That means 
Unity doesn't mean uniformity. Doesn't require, require that you dissolve your identity. Uh, that will be a mistake. And uh, I will finish making this last comment about Chile. I am very glad to, to be here in Egypt. Some of my friends, I am a Christian Democrat, I am a member of the Christian Democrat Party, that is a very secular uh, political party. But we were against Salvador Allende. And some of my colleagues here, Heraldo Muñoz, Sergio Vitar, were minister of Salvador Allende. And we share the same view. In a way, we have a responsibility in the destruction of the democracy in the last years of Mr. Eduardo Frey, the father, and Mr. Allende. Because the quarrel, the fighting between the, the left and the Christian democracy was so hard that we collaborate to the destruction, to the destruction of democracy. Then we have the coup d'etat. And a lot of people were prosecuted. And we, the Christian Democrats, we are supporting the movement in defense of human rights. And we began to create a strong coalition between the people that were former Marxists, the Christian Democrats, the people that have very different commitment with the recent history of the, of the country. And we make that unified block in which nobody of us has to reject to their own personal history and don't, it was not necessary to be part of that coalition uh, uh, resigning to your conviction, to your ideology. I think that that is the way in which you need to create a very broad coalition, but a coalition, a unified coalition that doesn't mean uniformity. Thank you very much. We thank you very much indeed. <laughs> For a very thoughtful presentation. If I may try to maximize the usefulness of a moderator, I'll just uh, add one word addressed to all the speakers. Uh, this country is passing through a very difficult uh, stage in its modern development. And uh, we are eager to listen carefully to the experience of other people who went uh, through similar stages of transition. On the other hand, we want also to be educated in the general theory of transition from a non-democratic system to uh, a more democratic system, so to speak, because apparently there are some certain fixed patterns of change through revolution. So what we need from the speakers is to address both, because we need both. Educate us on what you consider the particularity of your own experience, which does not necessarily have to be identical to ours. But we have brains, we can say, well, uh, we, our situation is different from yours uh, on this and that. But on the other hand, we may definitely uh, get more educated through getting more familiar with the general pattern of transition from an ancien regime to a more uh, democratic regime. So if the wonderful speakers, each of whom uh, has uh, a history and an exposure and a contribution to the democratic life, of his own country, if you can address both aspects, because we definitely need both. And we are trying for a change to be good listeners to those who have similar experiences, or even to those who have different situations. We can do the comparison, but we do need to be enlightened and educated on both aspects of the problem, which is, by definition, uh, as uh, Dr. Saad uh, reminded me, I should have told you, that the subject uh, of discussion and of speeches in this session is the role of political parties and social movements. So kindly try to educate us more by addressing the two issues simultaneously. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Mr. Cesar Nava from Mexico. And you have the uh, CV or the biography. Uh, it's, it's, it's abbreviated, it's summarized because we know your exposures as great specialists uh, would take more than one page 
and more than the 10 minutes allocated. <laughs> so kindly go ahead, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon to everything. I would like to thank this opportunity to share the Mexican experience with you because it's only that, sharing. Because I'm convinced that there is not, there is not an only model for democracy or there is not an only way to democracy. There are ways to democracy. And the only thing that we can do is to share with you the way that Mexican people choose to make uh, their own democracy. Democracy is like music. There are lots of ways to make music. Uh, there is an universal language that we all understand, but the songwriter and the regional culture determines the music. So as sharing music, I'd like to share the Mexican experience making democracy. I will make three short points. First, a briefing, a historical briefing. Then uh, I will mention the topics that were intention and discussion between the transition. And finally, I will talk about 10 fundamental changes in Mexico these days. In Mexico, the PRI, as you know, remained in power since 1928 to 2000. 70, 72 years, so uh, it converted itself in the most, uh, in the oldest uh, ruling party in the world. Mario Vargas Llosa, the recent uh, Premio uh, Nobel Prize, uh, described the Mexican regime as a non-typical regime and told that Mexican regime was the perfect party dictatorship because it was not the dictatorship of a person or a ruler, it was the dictatorship of a party and it was harder to, to make a transition in that conditions. Uh, it's uh, difficult to point an exact date where Mexican transition began, but the majority of Mexican authors agree that Mexican transition begin in, began in 1968, when uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of students were killed at La Telolco uh, Plaza. The slaughter of Tlatelolco marks the beginning of Mexican transition. Then, until 1977 comes the first big electoral reform, and it is not until 1994 that the first presidential debate comes to the Mexican history. In 2000, as you know, Vicente Fox, uh, the Mexican president under PAN, wins for the first time ever the election, the presidential election from an opposition party. So it takes, it took for Mexican 72, 72 years to uh, separate PRI from the power. But good news is for you, it will be a lot shorter. <laughs> then in 2006 uh, come the second election won by PAN, by Felipe Calderón. I must say, between parentheses, that PAN was created in 1939. So it took to the PAN 61 years to get the power. It was a very, very long wait for my party. I had the honor to be the president of PAN until last December. And it was, it, it is our history. We decided, uh, a long way, we decided uh, not to should not to take any violent method, and we took 61 years to take the power. And now we are in the face on the next presidential election in 2012, and the best news for Mexico is that nobody knows who is going to win the election. That's the best outcome of democracy. I will make my second point, proposing 10 axes of discussion that were present during all this year, these years in Mexico, and, and which are points in permanent tension. And I want to mention it, to share it with you, and to know that uh, there are, in, in some cases, are extremes, but in most, of ca in most cases, you can, you will find the, the intermediate point and the right solution for your country, I am sure. First, we have a tension between the desirable changes versus the possible changes. The aspiration of people versus the feasible changes. There is a huge gap between these points. And all, all in democracy is about 
the administration of expectations. Uh, huge expectations may go to frustration if change comes uh, uh, slow, in a slow way, or if uh, the government or the head of transition doesn't teach the people about the way to transition. It will take a lot of uh, effort, and we must know from the beginning that the ideal changes will not be possible. The possible changes will be, of course, the physical changes. As somebody said, politics at the end is the arts of possible, not the arts of impossible. Second, there will be, and there is a tension, we had a tension present in Mexico between the desire to reinforce the executive versus the desire to reinforce the legislative branch. It is a permanent uh, question that m must be solved in the right way for each country. Third, there is also a tension between the mechanisms of represent representative democracy, like the parliament, typical parliament, but versus the mechanisms of participative democracy, like instance, referendum, or citizens, uh, citizen candidates. Fourth, we have a tension between the desire of punishment against uh, of past crimes and felonies versus the amnesty or forgiveness. It is also a permanent tension that must be solved. These are extremes that must be find a point of common understanding. Five, there is also a permanent tension between the partisan monopoly of candidates versus the possibility of have citizen candidates, the possibility of open uh, the candidates for all citizens. Uh, six, there is also a tension between the unity of electoral organs versus the separation of judicial or judiciary function. In Mexico, we have an, a citizen branch who organizes the elections and a, a judiciary branch that qualifies the election. Seven, there is a tension, a, perfect, a permanent discussion between re-election or one-time election only. Eight, there is a tension between the rule of majority clause, which means automatically who wins the election has the control of the Congress versus limitation of overrepresentation. Ten, we have, uh, nine, sorry, we have a tension between free shopping of TV and radio spaces versus the monopoly of a state in regarding the contracts of TV and radio uh, times. And finally, uh, permanent tensions between private funding of the elections and the parties or public funding of the elections of the parties. And we have to resolve all, all these issues and we are also still resolving the, this because it is a permanent state of change. Finally, I will uh, share with you 10 fundamental changes, changes we have had in our country in the last years. First, we passed from a country of charismatic leaders to a country of institutions. Second, we passed from a country of violent mechanisms to get power to peaceful elections. Last elections were decided by only the 0.3% of votation. And, and, thank, and we can be thankful that no violence was present in the street. Third, we pass from a, a regime of the imperial president, so-called by Enrique Krause, a Mexican uh, story, story man, to a real division of powers and functions 